Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. G. Marshall. Place not your trust in princes, the great and good book tells us, and sound advice, indeed. It would appear to be, especially since we are also told, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Royalty, nobility in general, isn't as popular as it used to be. But at one time, almost every little girl wanted to marry a prince or a duke or an earl. And if her rich American daddy had the money, he could always buy her one. You're 25. I know that, Mama. It's time you were married. A beautiful girl like you. I can't help it if nobody asks me. That's not true. You've been turning fellows down. Now, you can't be too particular at your age. It's all right, Mama. I'm already spoken for. Who? Who is he? Well, I'm not all that sure, Mama. I think it's the devil. Our mystery drama, The Kingdom Below, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Phyllis Newman and Fred Gwynn. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. They transformed the face of the nation. History refers to them as robber barons. Most of them were born poor and died rich. They devoted their lives to amassing money. And then, when they had more than they could ever spend, they realized they had missed out on something very important. Something which could be described as culture. And so they pursued culture as avidly as they once had chased after money. And where was culture? Why, it was in Europe. And what was culture? It was immortal paintings for the mansion, masterpieces of sculpture for the grounds, and a titled foreigner for a son-in-law. From the diary of Miss Mayetta Stebbins. Rome, July the 3rd, 1887. I do believe that music will drive me out of my wits. Not that I had too great a supply to begin with. We are living in a palazzo. (laughs) And didn't Mama give it to me for calling it a palazzo? Palazzo, darling, palazzo. But I want to go home. Anyhow, I shouldn't complain about Mama. Poor Papa. He's the one that really catches it. Every morning, it's the same old thing. Ah, uh, Prego Annunziata, the, uh, 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 Udi. You know, the eggs. I haven't had a decent egg since we left the States. Now, you said ain't at the opera last night. I thought I would die of shame. Who was there to hear me? Nobody but a bunch of foreigners. How many times must I tell you, Benjamin, in this country... We are the foreigners. Yeah, that's why I can't hardly wait to get back the good old USA. Benjamin, I don't think you're taking this trip seriously. Now, you just look here. I got writer's cramp from signed checks. You wanted that painting of that uh, fat lady? Oh, Benjamin Franklin Stebbins, you are talking about a genuine Caravaggio. Yeah, and you are talking about 50,000 simoleons. (laughs) 50,000 of Uncle Sam's finest. 50,000 of those long green men. But did I blink an eye? No, no. Wrap her up, I says. I'll write you my check. $50,000 for a Caravaggio. You stole that painting. I stole it? (laughs) You want pictures of naked fat ladies? Well, I can take you into places back home where... Benjamin, 
Your daughter is sitting at the table. Mama, I know about those places. Oh, my sakes alive. What do you know about those places? I know well-brought-up young ladies ain't supposed to talk about them. Ain't. Ain't. There it is again. Benjamin, you've corrupted this child. <sighs> okay, Mayetta. Don't say ain't in front of your mama. It discombobulates her something fierce. Now, we have to have a serious discussion. Does that mean I have to leave the room? No. It concerns you. Uh, Benjamin, I, you give generously of your money. I have no complaints. Thank you kindly, ma'am. But you're not putting your heart into this thing. Which thing? The thing we really came for. Okay, you tell me. What did we come here for? To find a husband for Mayetta. Why can't Mayetta find her own husband? Benjamin! Did anybody have to find you a husband? No, you found one yourself. And look at me. Yeah, look at you. Twenty-nine years ago, you were filling up beer mugs in your old man's saloon. Benjamin, <laughs> is that true, Mama? How can you say such things in front of the child? I'm not a child, Mama. It was the worst dive in the San Francisco waterfront. Where was the saloon? <laughs> there was no saloon. No? What was it then? Why are we getting off the subject? Uh, which is? Finding a husband for Mayetta. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nobody found you a husband, and you wind up being married to one of the 50th richest men in America. Now, Benjamin... You don't believe it? Read the papers. Money isn't everything. It ain't? Oh, that word again. There's a world of people who don't say ain't. Yeah? It's a world of breeding, refinement, and culture. Is that a fact? And from that world, I want a husband for your daughter. That's a funny way to put it. <laughs> you want a husband for our daughter. Uh, well, what does you, our daughter have to say about it? Well, she's too young to know her own mind. So, what have you got on your mind? Now, Prudence Folsom, she came back to America last year with a count. <laughs> Skinny beanpole of a fella with a pot belly, a mustache, and a monocle. Looks like a dude to me. Now, you have twice as much money as George Folsom. So your daughter should do twice as well as his. Mayetta should get herself a prince, or at least a duke. Find her one. Well, what do you uh, say to all this, Mayetta? What do I say to all this? I don't know. Most of the time, I don't listen. I've never been in love. Maybe I'll never fall in love. Maybe I can't, or... Or maybe I'm so much in love, I don't realize it. Could I be in love with someone I've never met? <laughs> Sounds silly. I could never talk about it to anyone. Yet, the, the truth is, I don't know if I really feel this way... Or if I read about it somewhere in some novel long ago. <sighs> well, the next morning it began over again. You girls know what day this is? It's the 4th of July. Oh, how I wish I was back home. Benjamin, we are not returning until Mayetta gets... I can see him now. Stepping down Fifth Avenue, the Grand Army of the Republic. Benjamin! Be the first year I ain't marching with him. Ain't again. What do I have to do to get back to the land of the free and the home of the brave? Well, first, you must stop saying ain't. Done. You ain't never going to hear that word pass my lips again. Second, you must find a titled foreigner for your daughter. And what if she turns him down? How can she turn him down? She ain't met him yet. Every time you get really excited, you sound like the red-haired girl I first met in your old man's saloon. What are you talking about? Let it pass. <laughs> now, look, we we've been here a month. She hasn't met anyone yet. She's met hundreds of people. She met all kinds of nobles, fellas with titles. Toss a coin. Put the names in the hat. Pull her one out. Well, not one of them is good enough for her. Ah, uh, now we're on to something else. Fortune hunters. Yeah. Dried up, wizened, elderly men. Uh-huh. And the young ones. Oh, too slick by half for my taste. I wouldn't trust any of them. Benjamin... We are not meeting the right people. We're meeting everybody there is. The word is out. The rich American heiress is in Rome to find a husband. We're getting them from all over Italy. They're coming from France and Spain. Uh, <clears throat> I understand tonight we're going to meet a couple from Austria and uh, Russia. You see, Benjamin, we were wrong. We? Uh, <clears throat> what did I do? Well, 
We let it be known that the fabulously wealthy Americans were here with a marriageable daughter. We thought we'd be swamped. And we were. But a man of true aristocratic breeding would be repelled. He would have contempt for us. He would label us as nouveau riche, as parvenu, as arriviste. I'll tell you something, Mama. I happen to know what every one of them words mean. And you want to know the truth? That's exactly how we're behaving. Well, I want a prince for my daughter. I want a man of background and breeding. A man who can trace his family down through the centuries. But, Mama... And let that family become even richer and greater and finer because of what my daughter will bring to it. Okay, Mama. Sure. That's what I want. You know why? It don't matter, Mama. As long as you want it. The old man here will see you get it. Uh, somehow. Yeah. Well, now, you talk about the saloon my father owned on the waterfront. Look, I won't bring that up no more. My father didn't own that saloon. What? What are you saying? I, I, I have no Patty Morgan was the one and the only sole proprietor. That's true. But Patty Morgan wasn't my father. What? And Katie Morgan wasn't my mother. They adopted me. They took me in. I, I was one of those kids you read about. A newborn baby that's found on the doorstep. Mary. Mary, you... Now, who you... was my mother? My father. I'll, I'll never know. Who am I? Where do I come from? I'll, I'll never find out. Well, now, is it so important? Yes. All right. Well, find me a prince. A real prince for my daughter. You can do it. Sure. I mean it. You can do anything. What were you? A stevedore, a roustabout. Now, today, you're one of the 50 richest men in America. You performed a miracle. Now make another one. Find her a prince. I wasn't supposed to hear that conversation. But one thing about Mama and Papa, they spoke loudly. There were no secrets. I didn't want to say anything to Mama or Papa, but I wouldn't marry anyone they found for me. Unless, of course, it was the person I was in love with already. But how would they know who he was? I didn't even know myself. Papa disappeared right after breakfast. I found out later he'd gone to the American Embassy. My name is Thurman Trueblood. What can I do for you, Mr. Stebbins? Who are you? I'm the third assistant secretary. Yeah. Well, young fella, I didn't ask to see the third assistant secretary, or the second, or even the first. I asked to see the ambassador. The ambassador is out. Uh, not to me, he ain't. Uh, my name's Benjamin Franklin Stebbins. Uh, I know that, sir. I'm a personal friend of President Grover Cleveland. I'm aware of that. So, you march right back in there and tell the ambassador that Ben Stebbins wants him. Uh, sir, I can't do that. Uh, they've all gone home to America to celebrate the 4th of July. And they won't return for uh, another two weeks. There's no one here, only me. Yeah. Well... Then I guess you'll have to do. Well, yes, sir. What's to be done? Uh, I want my daughter, Mayetta, to find a fine, handsome, young Italian prince from uh, a noble family that goes back to, uh, oh, uh, maybe old Julius Caesar or any of that crowd. Uh, Mr. Stebbins, I'm not sure that lies within the province of uh, the embassy's activities. Uh, son, what's the purpose of your job here? It's to foster closer relations between the Americans and the Italian people. Well, now, ain't that exactly what I'm asking you to do? But yes, but... Uh, uh, never mind, but... It, it, son, it's a losing battle. <laughs> uh, who's the most blue-blooded prince they got? What's his name? He's the uh, prince de Porto Corvo. Trot him around. Oh, you don't understand. He, he never goes to see anyone. Well, then we'll go see him. But the prince never sees anyone. Is that a fact? Now, just who does he think he is? Well, there are those who say... Yes? Who say what? Well, it, no, it's, it's all old wives' tales of superstitious peasants. Uh, but there are those who say he's the devil himself. there you are. We made you wait for the very last two words of Act One before we said something that puts everybody on notice. A rich, young, handsome prince. And there's suspicion around that he may be 
the devil. Well, the devil is a prince. He's called the prince of darkness. We shall shed more light in just a little while when I return with Act Two. They say money talks. Well, that isn't quite accurate. Money does more than merely talk. It commands. And what money wants, money usually gets. The moneyed Mr. Benjamin Franklin Stebbins, one of the 50 richest men in America, has come to Rome in the year 1887 to buy some culture, paintings, sculpture, and a titled foreign nobleman for his daughter. Now, Mr. Thurman Trueblood, let's get down to the facts at hand. This Prince de Porticovo, why do folks say he's the devil? Well, this is all local superstition. Isn't there even the tiniest little bit of fire and all the smoke? I couldn't say. I really don't know anything about the Prince de Porticovo. Why not? Why not? Ain't he one of the natural resources of the country? Uh, I'm afraid I don't understand. Oh, <laughs> which is why you're only third assistant secretary. But never mind, I'll take you in hand, boy. I'll educate you. Uh, sir, uh, uh, what's been attracting most of the foreign capital lately? The native nobility. That's what. Look at how many American millionaires have been investing in princes and dukes and counts. And uh, no accounts <laughs> and uh, whatnot. Well, that may be, sir, but... Now, uh... I'm coming here as a legitimate American businessman. I'm here to buy a prince for my daughter. So when I make an investment in a foreign country, which this is... I have the right to ask investment advice from the American Embassy. I'm not sure there's a precedent. Well, if there ain't, we're going to set one. Now, you say this Porticovo is the goods. I said uh, only that he comes from the oldest, most aristocratic family. Then we'll settle for him. But I know nothing about him except his name. Uh, just rumor uh, and hearsay. Why don't you invite him to a party at the Embassy? Send me the bill. <laughs> but nobody invites the Prince de Porticovo to a party. Uh, he does not accept invitations. Uh, I, I don't even know him. Then we'll go see him. You just don't go calling on the Prince de Porticovo. Why not? Well, it, it just is not done. That's why we're going to do it, boy. We're going to go out there for a drive this very afternoon. Oh, no. I couldn't leave my post here at the embassy. Embassy's closed for the holiday. It's the 4th of July. <laughs> Where does this prince live? Well, I understand, uh... I think uh, they say he has a villa some ten miles north of the city. We'll pick you up at noon and get to the Prince's Palace in time to be invited for lunch. Oh, but Mr. Stebbins... Stick uh, with me, son. I'll see you get made an ambassador yet. <laughs> Mama didn't know whether to faint with joy or dance with happiness. I think she did a little of each. She couldn't stop kissing Papa. She screamed in positive raptures of delight. Oh, Benji, Benji, you can. You will work miracles. Nothing to it. And this, this young man from the embassy arranged the whole thing. Like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> hey, Mr. Stubbins, he said, you want to meet a genuine Italian prince? Let me give you a knockdown to my pal, the Prince of Porta Corvo. Oh, Porta Corvo. Oh, that name. That name alone sends romantic visions through me. <laughs> Let's drive out this very day, he says, and have lunch. Oh, Benjamin, you are the most wonderful man. Maybe I knew what I was doing when I come out for Grover Cleveland. Oh, <laughs> yes, indeed you did. Next time, don't tell me who's going to win the election. Women ain't, uh, uh, I mean, aren't. Qualified to. Oh, you can say ain't, Benjamin. Go ahead, say ain't as much as you want. Mayetta, dear, have you heard? We're to have lunch with the Prince of Porto Corvo. I heard. And the moment I heard that name, I... I had a sudden feeling of... Of what? I felt dizzy. But it wasn't an alarming dizziness. It was more of a delicious, out-of-this-world feeling. I seemed to be lighter than air. I seemed to float in space. Everything was so, so wonderful. I remember we got into the carriage. We stopped at the embassy where a very tall, serious young man joined us. Uh, Mayetta, honey, this is Mr. Thurman Trueblood, Assistant Secretary at the Embassy. 
Uh, actually, Miss Stebbins, I'm only the third assistant secretary. Uh, son, when you blow your horn, sound it loud and clear and strong in a major key and uh, leave out all the minor notes. I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance, Miss Stebbins. But I hadn't the eyes to see him with, or the ears to hear him, nor the voice to answer. It was only one thought that filled my entire being. The prince. The prince of Porto Corvo. And the name. I began to remember the name Porto Corvo, but... But from where? Why? For some reason, this was not the first time I had heard it. Porto Corvo. Oh, Prince of Porto Corvo, I love you. I love you. I have always loved you. We drove through the beautiful countryside, and soon we came upon a villa. It was small, but perfect. A small, flawless diamond. It was neither big nor ostentatious. It was the kind of home I had always dreamed of, set in the middle of what appeared to be a park. There were streams and gardens. It was altogether a place of rare delight. I had read that phrase somewhere. But that's what this palazzo was. We drove in through the gate. A footman held the horses. A butler ushered us into the house. What a charming, charming palazzo. Oh, Mayetta, darling, come here. Look at this painting. How did you work it, sir? Uh, how did I work what? Well, how did you wangle this invitation from the prince? How, how did I... Son, I was about to ask you. You mean you didn't? Now, uh, Thurman, uh, what are you trying to tell me? That you didn't arrange no, it? No, sir, I did not. Well, then why did the dude in the short pants and the velvet coat with a silver button say the prince was expecting it? Oh, Mr. Stebbins, I, you're having a little joke, aren't you? Oh, darling, this cup, it must be a... It is. It's a Cellini. Now, uh, son, I'll be hanged for a horse thief if I can tell you what's going on here. Mr. Stebbins, um, what the local people say about the prince being the devil? Uh, now, uh, son, remember, you're an American. Uh, hold the line. Uh, but to know we were coming, he had no way. Suppose he is the devil. What if he is? He don't scare me. I've already been to hell. <laughs> Twenty-five years ago, son. Yes, sir, I was with General George Henry Thomas, the Rock of Chickamauga. There was hell for you. <laughs> sir, I'm not sure that I did the wise thing. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this humble dwelling, but it is all I have to offer. Consider it yours. Mr. Stebbins, the celebrated Mr. Stebbins, so kind of you to come. I am your obedient servant, the Prince de Porto Corvo. How do, Prince? Uh, shake hands with the missus here. Honey, this is the Prince. Oh, your, your royal highness. And our uh, little girl here, Mayetta, uh, named for her two grandmothers. How do you do? Is this how it happens? You look into his eyes and you see. What do you see? I don't know. You, you're you lost. You're lost in space and lost in time. Nothing matters and no one else exists in the whole world. You know your fate is sealed. Luncheon is served. May I offer you my arm, Miss Stebbins? Ah, uh, well, uh... Yes, of, of, of course. This way, please. Uh, Mr. Stebbins, Mrs. Stebbins, Mr. Trueblood. I know you will enjoy our little repast. Mr. Stebbins, how did he know my name? You didn't introduce me. He knows you're from the embassy. How does he know I'm from the embassy? Well, ain't there the seal of the United States of America on the carriage? We're not using the embassy carriage. We're using yours. Yeah, well, well, son, don't sweat about it. There's an explanation for everything. So explain this. Uh, I said there was an explanation. That don't necessarily mean I can tell you what it is. Dear diary, luncheon was a dream. The food, oh, the food was, how can I describe it? It was everybody's favorite. Was there ever such a host as the Prince of Porto Corvo? No. Now this 
is steak. Steak? Well, I'm having shad. And I have scrapple. Strawberries and cream. I have to tell you, Prince, this steak could only come from Kansas City. A shad like this must be from the Hudson River. <laughs> Nobody outside of Philadelphia knows how to make scrapple. Well, strawberries aren't in season, are they? My good friends, a host must live for his guests. Please enjoy your lunch. Yes, but how did you know how partial I am to shad? <laughs> I guessed it. Oh, you did nothing of the sort. Benjamin must have told you. Didn't you, Benji? Who, me? <laughs> Confess it. I did not know the sort. Oh, you men, you must have your little mysteries. Shall we begin? Uh, is it customary to say grace in this country? Uh, of course. For what we are about to receive, good Lord, we give thanks. Mm, Benji, this is really shad. Uh, wait a minute, Mama. Hmm? What is it, Benjamin? Mayetta, put down your spoon. Benjamin! I have to uh, talk with the prince here. My dear Mr. Stebbins, is something wrong? I'm not sure. Papa! I want you to tell me. Tell you what? What's going on here? Papa, are you feeling well? I don't know. But when I was a little kid at school, I remember reading a story about all them uh, heathen gods and goddesses. Oh, really, Papa? Is this the time to start Now, your... the devil... Okay, he wasn't exactly the devil, but he was the prince of the underworld. So I guess that's just about the same thing, huh? Oh, you, you must permit me to apologize for my husband, Your Highness. He does choose the oddest moments to tell his long-winded stories. Now, Benjamin... As I recall, this prince of the underworld kidnapped the daughter of one of the goddesses. And he took her down to hell with him. Don't anybody else remember that story? Everyone remembers, Benjamin. But I'm sure no one is really interested. So the kid remembered that she shouldn't eat. Because if she ate as much as one bite or took as much as one swallow, she'd be stuck there forever. And uh, <clears throat> so, Prince, if you'll excuse us, we're going to skip lunch. How dare you insult this man in his own home? This generous gentleman of the highest... Oh, please, Your Highness, you must find it in your heart to forgive him. Uh, Mrs. Stebbin, sometimes the heat in my country is upsetting to those who are accustomed to a more uh, moderate climate. Uh, may I suggest... Prince, I want to thank you for your hospitality. But we really have to be leaving. Mama, Mayetta? I shall do nothing of the sort. I intend to have my lunch. Mm, the shad. How tender. Mm, what a heavenly taste. Mama! All right. What do you suppose this is? Here you have Ben Stebbins, one of the most hard-headed practical men in the world, and he starts raving about something deep down, way past, in ancient Greek mythology. He looks at a handsome, sophisticated gentleman and sees the king of the underworld. Don't sell Benjamin Franklin Stebbins short. After all, he was smart enough to become one of the 50 richest men in America. I shall return shortly with Act Three. The word is perception. It literally means to see through. One man can look at a desolate, barren piece of land and see buildings and factories and stores, a great city. This is how men become rich. They see through, right through to the heart of the matter. They are not distracted by the cover or the color or the shape or the form. They see through to the essence, to the money. This is the kind of man we have in Benjamin Stebbins. And he accepts what he sees, no matter how fantastic or far-fetched or impossible. Dear Diary, that was quite a lunch. <laughs> Poor Papa. Why was he having such a hard time at the table? Mama was so embarrassed, I thought she'd die. And that milk and water Mr. Trueblood wished the floor could open up and swallow him. After all, he had to uphold the dignity of the United States government. Well, both of them began to eat. Papa refused to touch a bite on his plate. And I know how he loved his steak. I ate my strawberries. Papa yelled at me. Don't, Mayetta. Don't. It's all right, Papa. Young lady, you come along with me. Benjamin, we have all been embarrassed enough. I want to talk to my daughter alone for a minute. 
Now, you listen to me and step this way, Mayetta. Uh, Your Highness, I must keep apologizing for my husband. Mayetta, don't you get up from your chair. My dear Mrs. Stebbins, surely a girl must listen when her father commands. Is it not written, honor thy father? Come in here for a minute, Mayetta. Mayetta, honey, you you got to believe me. You just got to. I believe you, Papa. Then we're getting out of here right this minute. No, Papa, I want to stay. But you said you believe me. I do. There's... There's something about it. I don't care. You didn't listen to what I was saying. It doesn't matter. Mayetta, I'm taking you home. I'm home now, Papa. No. Come on now. What can you be telling me? I love the prince. You must listen to me, did you? Did you ever hear of a more practical, down-to-earth fellow than your old man? Papa, I know what you're going to say. Put your money on the table. Show me the figures. Let me examine the merchandise. That's always been me, honey. No fancy notions, no crazy ideas. So when a fellow like me starts talking about, uh, about devils and, uh, and the underworld, you have to listen. Now, this prince, he... Well, how else can I put it? He ain't human. And what if he isn't, Papa? What do you mean, what if he isn't? I love him. I've been in love with him all my life. But how could you? You, you, you only met him an hour ago. How do I know that? Oh, my poor little girl. No, Papa. I'm not your poor little girl. Not any longer. You always did want to marry a prince, didn't you? Every little girl does. You sure you didn't read that story I tried to tell everybody just before? Sure, I read it. Back in school. You didn't see yourself as the heroine. Being carried away by the great god of the underworld. Becoming the queen. Oh, it's so hard for you to realize I'm in love. And when you're in love, it doesn't matter who he is. But it does, Mayetta. It does. We love each other. When was this decided? It was meant to be. And now, Papa, we mustn't keep the others waiting. Dear diary, Papa walked out on the terrace and I returned to the dining salon. The prince, my prince, was so charming that soon everyone was smiling and having a wonderful time. When lunch was over, the prince took my arm and we went for a stroll. Who are you? You know. I know? Your father has told you. Well... <laughs> You don't believe him? Yes. You believe him. And it is true. Yes. I have always loved you. Why? Oh, because you are so light, so filled with beauty. For a girl who's supposed to be so beautiful, I've... I've had remarkably few bows. And considering that my father is so rich... Yes, I know. You see... I did not want anyone to fall in love with you. What does that mean? More important, I did not want you to fall in love with anyone else. And so I did not permit a thing like that to happen. How could you stop it? You see, my sister is... <laughs> it will be very difficult for you to believe this. I know I must believe anything you choose to tell me. My sister is Venus. No one in the world may fall in love without her permission. I... I see. I've waited for you, just as you have waited for me. I love you. I love you. We shall be married. Oh, oh that'll make Mama so happy. You don't know how she always wanted me to marry a prince. I know. Oh, and not just getting married, but, but the idea of the wedding. It will be a beautiful wedding. Oh, how Mama's going to enjoy every single detail of the planning. Oh, my dearest, I am afraid your mother will not be allowed to come. She... she what? The wedding will be held in Olympus. Where's that? It's where my father lives. Why can't my mother come? My dearest one, your mother will not be permitted to leave the underworld. I, I don't understand. Your mother and this gentleman, Mr. Trueblood, they must depart shortly for the underworld. Why? You know why, my dearest. They dined at my table. 
Do you mean they'll be dead? Dead is a word that is only used in this world. But, but, but will they be dead? They will lead another existence elsewhere. Will they be dead? Yes. It is the law. What law? All who partake of my hospitality must remain forever my guests. Papa. Papa didn't touch a bite. He will leave. I shall not see him for a long time. Papa won't let you take Mama away. Darling, darling, you must not allow yourself to become sad. Remember, we love each other. Yes, but... And love is all. Love is enough. But Mama won't be able to come to my wedding. Mama will never forgive me. Mama will not know about your wedding. Why won't she know? Because Mama has already sipped from the cup of forgetfulness. What's that? It is to prepare one for the next world. Mama is waiting for the journey to the underworld. She and Mr. Trueblood are waiting for the boat. No. No, I want to see Mama. No, my darling, you do not. I do. I, I want Mama. I tried to spare you this. Oh, Mama. Oh, Mama, you, you, you're not going anywhere. Tell me you're not going anywhere. Child, are you speaking to me? Mama, don't look at me as if you don't know me. Who are you, child? Who am I? D don't you know me? Don't you know your own daughter, Mayetta? Mayetta. What a lovely name for a beautiful girl. Mayetta. For Grandma May and Grandma Etta. Uh, goodbye, child. I wish we had more time to chat, but I must... Please. Don't go. Come back. Come back. She must go, my darling. I want to go home. Soon, my beloved. I will take you home. No. No home on, on Fifth Avenue in New York City. I want to go home. You will come with me. We have always loved each other. We are to be married. No. Papa. Please, Papa. Papa, save me. Help me, Papa. Now, oh, what's all this holler and mayetta? You ain't a little girl no more. You've got to behave like a marriageable young lady. I don't want to get married. Not to him. I told you not to touch a bite of food. Oh, please, Papa, don't scold me. Just help me. And help Mama. They're taking Mama away. Honey, what can I do? I'm just a living, breathing, mortal man. He's one of them gods. What can I do? Oh, Papa, did you ever in all your life ask, what can I do? Never. Whatever it was, you just went out and did it. Please, please, Papa, save Mama and save me. I don't want to marry him. But you're in love with him. No, Papa, I'm not. I was in love with the idea of him, of, of a prince. Oh, Papa, please. All right. Just sit there quiet for a bit. <clears throat> uh, Your Highness. Yes? My uh, little girl wants to break her engagement. <laughs> I am afraid that is impossible. I love your daughter. Do you? With all my heart. Well, then, if uh, you're a man of honor, you will ask for her father's permission. You have already permitted it. You brought her to my house for this purpose. Oh, but that was before I knew who you were. You knew who I was. You always knew it. I didn't know for a fact. I may have suspected we quibble over words. All right, then let's argue facts. You say you love my daughter. You say you love her with all your heart. What are your plans for? To make her my queen. And uh, just where are you going to live? In my palace. Which is where? <laughs> you know where. Down there? <laughs> way down there? Down there in hell? In the dark? In the damp? Where there ain't... Never a ray of sunlight, not one blade of grass, not one flower, not one bird. Why do you want to bring her there? To brighten my life. I know that, but uh, who's going to brighten hers? Can she live in the dark? No, she needs fresh air, the blue sky. I will make her happy. How will you make her happy? She'll wither away. She'll die. No. They all die. All your wives. What happened to your first one, the one we all read about? How many have you had since? Uh, how many will you have after Mayetta? Mr. Stebbins. You bring them to your palace for their youth, their beauty, and their freshness. But all of that disappears very quickly in the poisoned air of your kingdom. They fade ever so quickly. They die ever so soon. 
It isn't love on your part. You need them. But you never love any of them. I love your daughter. Prove it. How? Give her up. What? Save her life. Let her live. I love her the way I have never loved any of the others. Then don't treat her the way you did the others. Let her live. Let her have her life. The beauty and the loveliness of the world above. How long can she live with you? A few months, a year? (laughs) Then she'll be old. No, no. You know I'm right. Man who loves is a man who must be willing to give. (laughs) Give her up. I love you. Mayetta. I love you. You will never know how much I loved you. Dear diary, I'll say one thing about this country. It may be the food or the air, but the fantastic dreams you have in this place. If I ever told anybody what I'm writing on this page, who would ever believe it? We were supposed to visit this prince and and poor Papa. Did he ever catch it from Mama? It seems we got to the place where he was supposed to live, and what do you think? This can't be the place. It's a heap of ruins. Well, nobody's lived here for hundreds of years. Everybody said it's where he's supposed to live, right, Mr. Trueblood? Yes, sir, as far as I know. Yes, but you said we were invited for lunch. Somebody must have played a practical joke. Oh. I dare say. I was told a titled foreigner lived here, Mrs. Stebbins. In a godforsaken place like this, only the devil would live here. Well, ma'am, the devil's a titled foreigner. He's the prince of darkness. July 5th, 1887. Dear diary, I've come to a certain conclusion about princes. More than ever, I intend to marry one. But I have an idea that the best possible prince is the one you make for yourself. Now, Papa was just a day laborer until Mama took him in hand and made a millionaire out of him. That's because she saw the possibilities. Now, I look at Mr. Thurman Trueblood and I... I wonder what I can do with him. Well, it'll be fun to try. She did, and it was. Well, now, little girls dream of princes. What do little boys dream of? This whole business of dreams now, it can get us into more trouble than it's worse. Dreams. Some of them are so real. How do we know they're only dreams? Do you ever get the feeling that one day you'll wake up and find yourself where? Asleep or awake, I shall return shortly. And they lived happily ever after. At the risk of being an old curmudgeon, I must ask, who lived happily ever after? The data tells otherwise. Most girls who marry princes have a relatively bad time of it, especially if you read the papers. The truth is that princes, as a rule, make great lovers but bad husbands. And for the long haul, what the girls like is for things to be the other way around. Our cast included Phyllis Newman, Fred Gwynn, Paul Hecht, Bryna Rayburn, and Roger Barron. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, Subscribe to this channel.